and a very good morning to you too, Racing Welfare. I should introduce myself to start with, despite the very good PR that Racing Welfare have done on this really brilliant uh, initiative, so you should know my name by now, but I'm Rod Street, I'm Chief Executive of Great British Racing and British Champion Series Limited, and crucially, and very relevant to today, I'm a Racing Welfare Trustee and a very proud and privileged trustee of what is a fantastic charity. I love the idea of this and I've looked back at some of the really interesting people you've had join you for your racing conversation so far and I'm going to take the lead from them really and follow the same format and tell you a little bit about me and, and my career and give you some background as to how I got interested in racing and how my life has evolved since then. But then really importantly I'd like to hear from you and use the message function and take some questions from you and hear about you and where you got interested in racing, what's on your mind right now, how you found this extraordinary lockdown and anything else you want to talk about. I think we've got about 45 minutes. Um, and so maybe the first 10 or 15 minutes, I'll, I'll talk about my career, but I know about me. So um, if more interested is me knowing about you. Um, it all began for me, um, and it's often the case, isn't it, that somebody introduces you to the sport of, of horse racing. And in my case, it was my mum's partner back in, the, in the, the late 70s when I was still a boy. And he was a board man in a betting shop. His family had a, a chain of betting shops on the south coast. We, we don't have board men anymore, do we? But it was a, a, something I, I remember vividly. And he was a keen racing fan and when he wasn't working in the shop he'd be watching it on the, the television back in the days of the original ITV and the ITV7 and as a, a curious kid I would ask him why he was going you know getting so excited in front of the TV screen and so animated and he was very kind and, and very patient and he introduced me to, to, to racing and indeed um, betting on racing and his favorite bet I always remember this was a patent he loved to do a a 10p patent on a on a on a on a Saturday and 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 that that was my first bet too so that was the the, the interest in the sport and then um in the in the early 80s um along the road from me there was a guy that I went to school with called Warren Holt and I don't expect any of you to know that name but the surname's quite recognizable because his older brother a couple of years above me at school was Simon Holt the uh, racing commentator and we struck up uh, a great friendship, which we, we have to this day. And Simon was an absolute racing aficionado by then. And we, we found this shared interest. And Simon always knew an awful lot more about the sport than, than I did. And that remains very much the case to this very day. Um, he would go to Fontwell Park, I remember, when he was probably still a, a teenager with a cassette recorder and record commentaries and, and, and test himself to see if he could make it as a commentator. And we all found out the answer about that. He's been a, one of the, the UK's, if not the world's finest racing commentators for many, many years. So it was really, really lucky that through family circumstance and through friendship circumstance, I had this entrance into horse racing. Um, an early memory, and it's in one of the photographs shared, thinking of one of the horses I, I really first got engaged with, um, was Borough Hill Lad, uh, the brilliant Gold Cup winner trained by Jenny Pittman, such an athlete, such a, a, a talented horse. Um, and I think, again, were it not for, for injury uh, in his later career, he, he, he definitely had the potential to win more Gold Cups. Um, Years later, I noticed that a, a horse that, that people are, are quite affectionate about even nowadays, Might Bite, had really, really similar racing colours to Borough Hill Lad. And I mentioned it to the owner and, and the owner said it wasn't coincidental. He was also a huge fan of Borough Hill Lad and they wanted a set of colours that, that resonated with, um, with that horse. So that was, that was one of the first horses that really did it for me, which would have been in, in the early 80s around... 1982. Um, I didn't, when I, when I left school, go straight into horse racing. That took some years before I made my way in the sport. Um, my mum's partner had two huge influences on my life, really. Um, the racing interest and also he was a really brilliant performer um, and very specifically he was an Elvis impersonator 
and we would go on holiday every year to holiday camps around the country in Devon or Cornwall or in Great Yarmouth and he would enter the talent competition and invariably win it and he'd wear the whole rhinestone jumpsuit and do a couple of numbers and he was really really good and I really fell in love with that world the world of, of entertainment of holiday camps and and all that that went with it and so my my first um, job was a, as a blue coat at holiday camps um then owned by labrooks funnily enough with those um, racing and betting connotations uh, labrooks had camps all around the country and so the first couple of years of my life were were very much hidey high ho ho um that led to a career in travel and tourism and I went from working in the UK to working overseas and I worked in Spain and Turkey um, and America and I became a manager for a tour operator looking after different uh, regions uh, of Europe overseas and it was all very customer focused and leisure focused and you learn a lot and um, people's holidays are quite rightly tremendously important people work hard all year they have their two week break a lot is invested in it both financially and emotionally and you only have one chance to get it right and so that was a, a, a great learn for me over the years in, in delivering customer service to people in solving any number of problems and you get any number of problems when you're in the, the holiday business um, but it was great grounding for me and, and it still involved some entertainment there were still weekly cabarets that I perform in and, and kind of kept my hand in and that kept me quite busy until the early 90s. And in, in 1990, I came back to the UK having done this for a few years um, at, at the height of then the, the, the early 90s recession and found myself largely unemployable. Um, so I started performing comedy and uh, I, I come from Sussex, but I moved up to the Midlands to stay with a friend, um, which is where I eventually met my, my wife of 27 years. Um, and I started performing comedy in, uh, in clubs uh, around the Midlands. I promoted comedy nights and um, sold tickets and, and, and learned a lot about getting bums on seats. I compared the events and I, and I also uh, performed not to any great standard. Um, probably the, 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 the height of my, my, my comedy career, a, a, a friend and I, we entered the talent competition um, at um, uh, a, a club called the King's Club in Birmingham. And the prize was an appearance on a BBC programme called Pebble Mill at One, which some of you might remember. And we actually won that and we did get to appear on, on Pebble Mill at One, but we, um, we didn't perform very well on the day. I think we left our, our performance on the gallops, you might say, and that was probably the peak of the comedy career, but it was a, a great experience. Um, having been recently married and, and started to think about paying a mortgage and getting a bit more serious. Um, I did really need to get what my, my, my late mum would have said was a, a proper job. And um, one of the managers at a venue where I was performing cut out this tiny advert from the local paper and said, there's a job in here, you should go for it. And it was for an assistant commercial manager at Utopsita Racecourse. This guy knew I was a racing fan and we'd gone racing together um, on numerous occasions and that was kind of our shared interest and he said to me look you know go for it um, you've got lots of experience in leisure um, you know you're, you're needing to, to, to you know to step out and actually get a, a, a proper career give it a go so I applied for it um, I think in, in retrospect my CV looked terrible it just sort of said that for the past few years I've been having a lot of fun and, 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 and some of it overseas as well but I I wrote a letter and the letter was quite pleading and said to the, the race course, Look, give me a go, um, at least see me for an interview and you can make your own mind up. And lo and behold, I, I got an interview um, with the, the daughter of the chairman of that race course. The chairman was a guy called Stan Clark, later to become Sir Stanley Clark. And his daughter and I hit it off and, and the interview went quite well. Um, and I was asked to come back and have a second interview with Stan Clark, who was a formidable character and he um, uh, again for whatever reason seemed to to take a shine to me and I, I think it related to the fact that he was a self-made man he'd been a plumber and he'd been a, a plumber turned property millionaire and um, I think he was a little bit distrustful of the racing establishment um, 
and all that, that went with it. He was quite new to it in that he'd only bought Utoxy to race course a couple of years prior from the local council when it had been in quite significant difficulties. And I think he probably had interviewed a, a number of retired or semi-retired army officers and, and just didn't kind of feel a fit with them. And so he gave me a chance. And um, he told me in very, very plain English that it was a very good chance and I wasn't to bugger it up. And that was my entry into horse racing as an assistant commercial manager at Utoxis Racecourse. Um, and I suppose I, I, did, I did grab the chance. It was wonderful to be working in a sport that I'd followed as a fan for such a long time. Um, and it was remarkable, all of a sudden kind of being the other side of the wall. And, and I'm sure many of you will, will know this when you work or have worked within the sport. Um, you can be, you know, completely in awe of the people you're dealing with. I think in the first week at Utoxeter, one of the first phone calls I, I, I took was from Jenny Pittman, who um, gave me a bollocking about the state of the ground at Utoxeter, despite the fact that wasn't my responsibility. Um, I couldn't quite believe I was talking to people like that. Um, that was 1994, and they say that timing is everything. It, it came at a moment in time when Stan Clark was really interested in the racing business and was acquiring race courses. And by the time we got to 2003, which is quite some journey, we'd acquired nine courses, um, Brighton and Fontwell in the south, Newcastle in the north, um, uh, Sedgefield and uh, Chepstow, um, Hereford, um, and a, a real favourite of mine, Great Yarmouth Racecourse. So it was remarkable to go back to my old blue coat stamping ground where we had a, a race course and during that journey and again timing is is everything i managed to um i managed to work my way up uh, up, up the ladder and, and i went from being an assistant manager to a manager to a commercial manager and somehow ended up as group managing director of the the company in 2003 um um, at a time that we floated the company on the uh, on the AIM um, market and became a, a PLC. So it was a, a real journey. Um, I think Sir Stanley Clark, and he was Sir Stanley by then, maybe had you know a, an idea about what was going to happen in, in my career before I did. And he was very, very supportive and he was a, a tremendous mentor. You may remember him, those of you that are closer to, to national hunt racing, as, as the owner of a a really decent um, Grand National winner in Lord Galeen, who won that race in in 1997. But that was my that was my journey in horse racing and through running race courses. And um, really, the principles of travel and tourism have never been far away because the racing experience is a social experience for many people, um, and it's certainly a customer experience. People who choose to go racing as an owner or as a, a race goer, as a punter, for whatever reason, are, are spending their disposable income on, uh, the, on the racing experience and you've got a, a job to deliver it for them. And, and, and again, you only, you only get one chance to do that right. So that's my, my early racing career and I've been so fortunate to be associated with so many race courses. So Stanley sadly died in 2004 and a, a few years later, the, the family and the company took the decision to sell Northern Racing, um, and it was sold in 2007, at which point I decided it was time for me to go and try and do something else, having been there for such a long time. And I initially took a little bit of time out, and we had still then a, a fairly young family. We've got um, four children, um, which have kept us busy, particularly my, my wife. Uh, we bought a television now, I should, I should add. Um, and um, I took a few months off with the wife and family and, and kind of had to think about what I wanted to do next. And I got a phone call from the then chief executive of the British Horse Racing Authority, who said, we're looking at a project at the moment about racing's popularity and see whether it can do a better job of promoting itself to a wider audience in a world which is getting much, much more competitive. Uh, and I, I ran that project and that became something called Racing for Change which was back in 2009, I think. Um, and that subsequently became Great British Racing, which is the sports promotional arm and marketing arm. And we've now been established for a good 10 years. And, and the role of, of Great British Racing is a very simple one. It's to 
engage more people with the sport and to share our passion for something that we know is tremendously engaging and exciting with a, a wider audience. And all that Great British Racing focuses on is pulling people in. And there are many different ways that we do that. We use our jockeys as, as ambassadors and some of the younger jockeys now are fantastic um, in the way that they're presenting themselves. If you think of the likes of Asheen Murphy and Tom Marquand and Holly Doyle, we've got some terrific ambassadors and the same over, over the, the jumps with the likes of, of Harry Cobden and, and, and many others. Um, we tell the stories about our horses, the horses are the heroes. If they could speak, they could do an even more remarkable job for us. But um, telling, the, telling the, the stories of equine achievements is incredibly important to us. Telling stories behind the scenes as well, that you know, so much goes into the delivery of a race day. And really, you know, that's kind of the final part of the, the journey for many people, but telling people about life behind the scenes at stables, the amazing work of stud and stable staff, um, the breeding world, there are a, a plethora of remarkable stories that the sport has got to tell. And, and that's what GBR does. And it's a competitive world out there, as everyone knows, there are lots of things that people can spend their leisure pound on. There are lots of other sports promoting themselves as well that, that want the same customers as we do. Um, life is, is challenging and it's, it's ever been thus, but we think that, that, that GBR has a really important role in the sport because we're very proud of the sport we've got and the stories that we tell. And that kind of brings me up to date, really. Um, I feel really privileged to work in, in, in horse racing and for it to, to have been much of my adult career. Um, I've learned an awful lot working for at racing welfare as a, a trustee. One of my most enjoyable days ever was when I went up to Moulton and spent the day with one of the, the officers there um, in, in um, Sarah Monkman. And we, um, we, uh, we had a coffee morning and some retired jockeys came in. They were all in their seventies and told me about their life um, as, as a jockey back in the day and, and their indentures and I had no grasp of what the challenges were then for, for, for teenagers coming into racing, working in conditions and circumstances which now probably wouldn't be quite as appropriate. But it was a wonderful, wonderful day up there. Um, I've been for a spell the chairman of the, Prof uh, of the Professional Jockeys Association as well. And again, that was a great privilege to learn more about the role of the jockey and the challenges that, that they have. And, and now in the role that we play at Great British Racing at the centre of the sport, um, it's, um, it, it involves me with everyone, um, tremendous charities, breeders, owners, trainers, the race courses, and, and importantly, the customers. So I feel very lucky. Um, that's not to say I don't have bad days, because um, I do have bad days, and I've had a a few during lockdown as well, which has been tough for, for so many people. But I'm conscious that bad days tend to follow you around regardless of the job you do, um, as, do um, as do politics and all of the other things that make life sometimes rewarding, but also sometimes very complicated. Um, and so largely, um, I remind myself on the, on the rare bad day that I have, that I'm very lucky to be doing something I enjoy. And racing has just put me in so many amazing positions over the year, too many to recount, where I just feel that I'm an incredibly lucky individual. Um, I shared a, a couple of additional photos with Racing Welfare that they put on this feed. And um, one, one is a, a, another early memory, really talking about the greats, um, was Dancing Brave, who was another horse that just really got me excited and engaged back in the, 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 the mid 80s. I think 1986 was his, his major year. Um, I, I remember going to the, the Derby that day when it was still on a Wednesday. Uh, and, and I think I bunked off work. I think everyone used to bunk off work for the Derby though. I think that was okay. Um, and I went with Simon Holt and, and a few friends and we just thought this horse was bomb proof. And I remember kind of staring open mouthed as he as he didn't quite make it to the to finishing post and was beaten by Sharastrani. He obviously went on to win a King George and to win an arc and um, to be there. We maybe came to a, a natural point really um, in this when I was just really finishing up anyway and, and talking about Champions Day and 
how fortunate we were with Champions Day that when we launched in 2011, um, it came at a time when we had Frankel come along. And I was there at Newmarket in, in 2011 when he won the Guineas in a style that may never be surpassed and was there in 2012 for his last run, which was in the champion stakes uh, and where he ended his 14 race um, unbeaten, to, uh, unbeaten career and ended up as the highest rated horse of all time. And it was just such a privilege to see him run so many times. And, and he came along at a time, I think, that was brilliant timing for British Champion Series because he got us off to a flying start. And as I've referenced earlier on in the chat, Life is often about timing. I think there have been a, a few sliding doors moments for me along the way when, um, when luck has been on my side. And, and to conclude really on the, on the career story, and I didn't learn this for many, many years afterwards, but the, the person that interviewed me all those years back at Utoxtra in 1994 told me that my letter originally went in the no pile. Um, and then they didn't have very many good applications and it went into the maybe pile and very late on it went into the interview pile and um, just goes to show that, that it really is um, sometimes fate that uh, guides you along the way. Anyway, I think I've spoken enough and while the technology is still working, I'd really love to hear about you and what you're interested in and what you'd like to talk about. And so there'll probably be another pause now while we potentially look at some questions. Oh, so Racing Welfare are asking me, what was my best joke from the, 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 the comedy scene? I, I think really um, the fact that I didn't make it as a comedian probably suggests I didn't have a best joke. Um, I used to ad lib, that was my style. I used to write my material the week before I performed and would really talk about current affairs and things. Um, I certainly had a, uh, an experience even worse than the, the technology one we just had earlier when I, I lost the audience where I performed at a venue in Birmingham for a guy who was clearly a bit mafia and um, he really pressured me to put on a gig at a venue that I thought comedy wouldn't work in. It was quite a tough place. It was in Digbeth in Birmingham. But anyway, um, turned up, promoted the night and whatever. Uh, and, and on the night, two people turned up and there were two members of the audience sat up front expectantly waiting for me to, to do my stuff. And like a, an old trooper, I, 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 I turned out and um, uh, did my thing. And within about five minutes, one of the two people started heckling me, which I thought really was a bit harsh in the circumstances. But the other guy in the audience had a go at the guy heckling me and said, like, give the guy a chance. He's only just come out. There's only two of us. They broke out into a fight and were both ejected from the building. Uh, and that really did sum up the, the comedy career for me. And I, I can truly say I've emptied a room. Oh, what a great question. We've got a question from Fran Marshall. Um, who, who said, Morag and I came to Utoxeter for your first Sunday meeting. Uh, I worked for Kelso, and we were also able we were also, uh, to have a Sunday meeting. Was I responsible for the trumpet fanfare and the entrance flags, or was it Sir Stan? It was completely Sir Stanley Clark. He loved his theme music for all of his race courses, this military marching uh, music. Um, trumpet fanfares at the beginning of races, um, he loved. He loved flags, he loved badges. Welcome to Utoxeter, welcome to Yarmouth, welcome to Brighton. Everyone had to have the, the big coat hanger smile and, and the badge. And I remember wherever we were racing around the country, Stan would be on the phone checking that the music was playing. And I think Alistair Down once wrote about it and, and he had a theory that, that Stan liked the music because it had everyone who worked for him marching in time to his beat, which kind of feels about right. So what a, what a great memory. Um, I've got some more questions here. This is, this is terrific. Um, I vivid, oh, so this is a, this is a question about Frankel uh, winning the champion stakes and it was a real, uh, I was there moment. Do I have any moments like this racing or otherwise that, that really got me? Um, 
racing wise, and I was there moment, um, I thought when um, Sprinter Sacra came back and won his second champion chase, that was uh, an exceptional reception for uh, a really, really talented horse. Again, um, terrific race commentary if you go online and, and, and play that back. Um, but I, I decided that day, I really thought he would, he would come back to his best and I didn't want to miss his return into the parade ring at Cheltenham, which is such an amphitheatre. So I, I watched the race on the big screen so I could get a good position uh, back around the winner's enclosure on the basis that, that he would win and come back in. And I got lucky and he did. And that was another one of those moments. Um, but over the years, there have been so many occasions when I've been delighted to be on a, on a race course. I think another Frankel memory for me was um, the amazing reception the horse got when he raced at York in the Judmont and the Yorkshire racing folk so proud of their racing uh, and, and the Ebor meeting and they they loved him being there and it was really interesting um, before he came out to the parade ring prior to the race I think they normally run I think it's the great voltager that normally comes before the the Judmont and what I thought were, were, were people in the parade ring for the great voltager were people who got an early slot to watch Frankel and and when the great voltager went off no one moved and the the, the parade ring remained absolutely packed because they were desperate to see him and to give this really uh, affectionate reception for Sir Henry Cecil as well, who they loved. So lot, lots and lots of them. Um, I think in, in other terms of, of I was there moments, and this is again racing taking me to a place that I wouldn't have otherwise been taken to. When racing was on the, the BBC, um, we were... At Northern Racing all sent two tickets to the Sports Personality of the Year Awards and one year and a very important year of the millennium year um, my chairman Stan Clark decided to take me on the other ticket and down I went to London to the studios and it was the year that they celebrated the sports person of the millennia and it was awarded to Muhammad Ali who, who then was you know a very frail man um, with his um, Parkinson's disease but at the end of the show, when the lights went up, um, I don't know what possessed me, but I, I came out of my seat and ran down the aisle and got to shake his hand because I just wanted to tell my kids and grandkids that I got to shake the hand of the greatest. And I didn't feel too bad because by the time I got to, 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 to join the queue to shake his hand, Sir Alex Ferguson and Mike Dillon of Labrooks were in front of me and they clearly thought the same thing. So that was a lovely, I was there moment. Um, Derek is asking um, what we do, what, what we'd like to see happen to promote racing more than it is now. Um, I think it really is generally well promoted, not just by Great British Racing, but by ITV. I think the sport is, is remarkably fortunate that not only does it have two digital channels in Sky Sports Racing and Racing TV, but it's on terrestrial television every single week 52 weeks a year and so i think the sport reaches a lot of people i think we can still do better at our storytelling and and i think what really captures people's imagination is human interest stories and so the more stories we can tell about the people behind the scenes in racing what actually goes into getting a horse to the races what happens post their career are greater opportunities we can we can tell um in an ideal world i'd like the sport to have more money to be able to do a bigger national marketing campaign to encourage people to come racing and to to get to feel what we feel about the sport but being realistic right now after coronavirus the challenges we have with racing finances i think we're going to have to do a, a lot of a, a lot of our work with, with our, our, our general promotions and working with broadcast partners because I don't think the money will be there for some time. And if the money is there, I think we have some other, other priorities. Getting some really nice questions here. Um, oh, Chloe was there for Sprinter Sacra as well. That's interesting. So we're on, on the same page there. Um, Paul Dalton, um, who I, I know well from his days as a trainer, in the Midlands and as a regular face that you talked to is asking um, one of his best days was winning the Dick Francis chase at Utoxeter and, and did I get to meet him I did get to meet him because he did a, a book signing there and, and I've got 
two or three sign books by him um, on my bookshelf still from that event. So yeah, um, I did I did get to meet uh, Dick Francis again. It's another one of those uh, amazing moments. Paul Paul Dalton, one of the nicest, smiliest people you could meet, who is now of course up in North Yorkshire, who um, I, I I think I saw on one of my 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 visits up there. How nice to see Paul um, Paul there today. And I'm just scrolling down through um, through all of these um, all of these other other questions to make sure I've not I've not missed any. Racing Welfare are, are asking me um, if there's anything else we can do to promote racing more effectively, taking the lead from other sports. Um, it's always easy to look at other sports and to think that you know they're doing something better, but every sport is different and has got a different fan base. So I think we. I think we use our assets really well. I think we could perhaps use data more. Um, if you think of sports like Formula One, um, or for that matter, even tennis with their Hawkeye, I mean, you know, there's lots of technology which gives you another insight into the sport. So I, I think it's really interesting to, to, to look at the speed a horse is traveling at. I think it's really interesting to talk about sectional times explained in a, in a very simple way. And, and if you think about how Serpentine won the derby. I think that's a really interesting story to people who maybe don't go racing very often to show, you know, what a gallop he set early on and what happened in the later stage of the, the races and how he managed to slip the field. So technology um, can, can, can always help us. But as we've known from today's broadcast, technology can sometimes um, get in the way as well. Um, what have I been doing to keep myself busy during lockdown? Um, well, I'm a really keen runner, so um, it's actually been a real joy to be at, at home more and, and to be running in daylight. So I've, I've been doing that. It's been quite busy still, though, and um, I think there's, you know, we've all learned lessons from coronavirus that those of us that were fortunate enough not to be furloughed and, and to have work to do found that with fewer resources, there was more demand on our time. So it's been quite busy, and I think the challenge has been keeping a discipline and getting the work-life balance right and, and shutting the laptop um, um, at, at the right time and going to do something else like walk the dog or sit down and chat with my, my wife and kids. And so just kind of managing that, that balance between work and, um, and play has been important. But it's been a, a strange period and, and I'm, sure, I'm sure like you, you know, we've all had a few difficult days and, and sometimes it's quite difficult to put your finger on why, but um, I think it's uh, the most extraordinary circumstances we've been in and, and sometimes it's been a bit claustrophobic and, um, and, and so I think like many um, we'll, be, we'll be much much happier when we get to something that resembles normality whenever, whenever that is. I'm just gonna just check for some more questions because I think we've now done about 45 minutes which was um, probably more than all of you can take. I want to just scroll down and make sure I've not missed any more questions. I don't, I don't think I have. Um, I think I'd like to, just to finish up by talking a little bit about Racing Welfare and what a remarkable charity it is and how it touches so many lives. It really has been an eye opener for me to be involved with the charity. I've learned more by coming to the regions and I've had a day with the team in Newmarket and a day in Malton and you get a much greater sense of um, what the charity does when you actually go out there and, and, and meet the constituents and you meet the people dropping into the regional offices. Um, and I think despite the challenges that we've had with coronavirus in, in recent months, a real positive has been that more people know the great work that Racing Welfare do and through the, the efforts of all of the racing welfare team, we've continued to raise important funds when our services have been in uh, ever greater demand. Um, and so um, it, it, it's just been, a, I think, a very positive spell for racing welfare in showing the industry um, what an important job it is. And, and despite the challenge, I think racing welfare will come out of this extremely well. It's been great fun working with them on a few ideas. The furlong factor, Great British Racing supported racing welfare in and um, that was a, a lovely distraction from some of the challenges early in lockdown and to see what talent we've got out there beyond 
the, 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 the tremendously talented people who work in the equine world. We've got some great performers and I'm sure we'll be doing another furlong factor. Um, and two more quick questions uh, from Maureen. Entrance, entrance fees may need looking at after this virus as quite a lot could be unemployed. Yes, I think the world will change. Uh, I, I think that race courses will have to give great thought to what the, the number of race goers is going to be in, in 2021 and, and beyond. It's a, an important point. And Mark Lode, Mark Lode is asking me, will I be joining us for the, the Qatar Goodwood Festival virtual preview tonight? Yes, I bought a ticket last week, a uh, bargain at a tenner. Um, I went to the Ascot one hosted by Nick Luck and it was brilliant. And it was the first profitable Ascot I'd had in quite some years. So I'm hoping for more of the same from the panel at Goodwood. And, and maybe on, on that note, I should thank you for joining today. It's been a real pleasure to talk a little bit about my career and, and see some of you um, interacting. So thank you very much for putting up with me. Apologies about the internet crash halfway through, but that's life, isn't it, right now? And take care of yourselves, stay healthy and safe, and look forward to meeting you um, on a race course in due course. Thank you very much.